Hello. In my last session, we looked at monastic life beginning to be restored at the end of the 9th century, after it's almost collapsed under influence of the Viking raids. And this reinvigoration of monastic life picks up pace in the 10th century. And the key player in this is a man called Dunstan. He's well connected. His uncle is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's had an education, been educated by a few Irish monks who are occupying the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey. And he is appointed to the court of King Athelstan, where he becomes quite a favourite and very influential. This makes him enemies and there are those who plot against him and they trump up some charges which Athelstan believes and Dunstan is, is thrown out of court. His enemies have him beaten up and thrown into a cesspit and he then goes to Worcester. He is then appointed as an advisor to Athelfled. She is in charge of the Midlands. She is the Lady of the Mercians, Alfred's daughter, leading the fight in the Midlands against the, the Danes here. And Athelfled left Dunstan a considerable amount of, of cash. When Athelstan dies, his half-brother Edmund becomes king, and then Dunstan is invited back to court, where he faces the same problems. He just becomes too popular, and there are plots against him, and he's on the verge of being banished from court again, and something happens. Now, according to the legend that I'm going to read you, um, this is the story. This is how the legend is reported in the Catholic Encyclopedia of 1913. The king rode out to hunt the stag in Mendip Forest. He became separated from his attendants and followed a stag at great speed in the direction of Cheddar Cliffs. The stag rushed blindly over the precipice and was followed by the hounds. Edmund endeavoured vainly to stop his horse. Then, seeing death to be imminent, he remembered his harsh treatment of Dunstan and promised to make amends if his life was spared. At that moment, his horse stopped on the very edge of the cliff. Giving thanks to God, he returned forthwith to his palace, called for Dunstan and bade him follow. Then rode straight to Glastonbury. Entering the church, the king first knelt in prayer before the altar. Then taking Dunstan by the hand, he gave him the kiss of peace, led him to the abbot's throne, and seating him thereon, promised him all assistance in restoring divine worship and regular observance. Whatever the truth, Dunstan was given Glastonbury an appointed abbot in 940, and his aim there is to restore a full monastic regime following the rule of St Benedict. And he's ambitious beyond Glastonbury. Dunstan is credited with recolonising abbeys at Malmesbury and Bath as well. He then goes on to be promoted as Bishop of Worcester, Bishop of London, and will end up as Archbishop of Canterbury. And between 940 and 970, those 30 years, there are some 30 new monasteries, either founded or refounded. Mostly these are in the Midlands and the South. Abingdon in Berkshire, Muchelney in Somerset, Ainsham in Oxford, Cranbourne and Milton in Dorset, in Devon, Exeter, Tavistock, Bookfast, Pershore and Evesham in Worcester, Coventry, Winchcombe and Gloucester, St Albans, Peterborough, and in East Anglia, Croyland, Peakirk, Ramsey, Ely, Bury St Edmunds. 30 foundations or re-foundations in 30 years, but each one independently interpreting the rule of St Benedict in their own way. Quick development, but it's been piecemeal. And in 973, King Edgar held a great council, invited people from all these establishments uh, to Winchester. And the result is what was described as the monastic agreement and monks and nuns of the English nation. That was its official title. It is now usually referred to as the Regularis Concordia. I've got a, a, a nice illustration here of King Edgar seated between Dunstan and Bishop Ethelwald of Winchester. 
Athelwald of Winchester writes up the agreement made here. And this agreement is reached with the aid of monks from Ghent and from Fleury. So it is not particularly English. It copies continental practice. What was different was the way that bishops were to be elected in England. It gave significant say to the monasteries and the abbots will come to dem dominate the episcopacy. Among the matters settled by this document was that the rule of St Benedict would be the only rule and it would be interpreted to the letter. And under the rule, a monk's day was divided into prayer and study and manual labour. By the time we get to the end of the 10th century, the manual labour bit has largely been dropped. Instead, the work is being done by lay brothers because they are not bound to observe divine offices, they can go out and work. Now, if you become a lay brother, you enter the monastery, you will have your bed and board, you will be fed, but you will leave your family behind. And they will work six days a week and do some essential tasks, of course, feeding animals, etc., which has to be done on Sunday. But generally, they will be given Sunday off for prayer and worship. And a monk's life at this time is governed by an official set of prayers, readings, psalms, canticles and antiphons, usually known in the Catholic Church today as the Liturgy of the Hours. In the past it's been called the Canonical Office or the Divine Office, in the Anglican tradition the Daily Office, and it's been revised over the years by Pius V, more recently by Vatican II. And imagine that you are a monk in this period, what is your day going to consist of? Well, you'll be woken by a bell for the first office, usually referred to as lords or nocturnes, the night office at either one o'clock or two o'clock. And you will go from the dormitory and enter the church choir and return via night stairs, wearing your night shoes. At five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning, it will be time for prime, first light, followed by mass. Then there will be a reading in the cloister about seven o'clock. You now change to your day shoes and then go about your ablutions. Visit the lavatorium. You will wash in cold water. 8 a.m. the service is tears, the third hour. That will be followed by Mass. This one might well be attended by any guests at the monastery or any locals, but they will be in the nave, they won't be in the choir with the, the monks. Nine o'clock, the abbot will preside over a meeting in the chapter house. There will be a reading of a chapter from the rule of Benedict. That will be followed by confessions, which the monks will do in public, then there will be remembrance of benefactors and prayers for those. And then the monks will get down to the daily business of the abbey, the administrative bit. 10 a.m., two hours for study and work. For one or two, that might be in a scriptorium. For most, it will be in the cloisters. The next service is at noon, sext, the sixth hour. 1 p.m., dinner is taken in the refectory. There will be a reading from scripture or another appropriate source, otherwise the meal is taken in silence. Over time, there is a, a quite an elaborate sign language that develops. 2 p.m., another service, knowns, the ninth hour. 3 p.m., you begin another two hours of study or of work before 5 p.m., vespers. Change your day shoes for your night shoes. 5.30 p.m., a light supper in the refectory. So perhaps bread, fruit, a glass of ale. 6 p.m., the last service of the day, compline. 6.30, bed. Now you notice that we've got these seven services and then in between study or work. All of this takes a lot of organisation. It requires individuals to take on specific responsibilities and in a typical monastery 
the main jobs that people will undertake are these. At the top, of course, the abbot. He's the man in authority. He can be removed, but notionally, they're elected and appointed for life. Beneath the abbot in a large monastery might be a prior uh, to work as a kind of assistant. Typically, they will be a sacristan. He's responsible for the maintenance of the abbey buildings, including the church. And he will have an assistant, the assistant sacristan. He will be the man who has to ring the bell for the services during the day, the daily hours. There will be a precentor to maintain the monastic library, a novice master to instruct and prepare the novices for monastic life, a cellarer is responsible for the few food, the drink and the fuel and the clothing and the outside property, the rents and revenues that might be due to the abbey from outside. A kitchener, responsible for the quality of the food and possibly also a refectarian for the organisation of the dining room. A hosteler to run the guest house, an infirmerer in charge of the infirmary and an almoner to distribute food to the poor, deal with pilgrims arriving, deal with beggars knocking on the, the abbey gates. All these posts are known as obedentiaries. And this burst of monastic activity, the late 10th century, continues with more standardised layouts. And a good example of monastic revival in the late Anglo-Saxon period is the monastery at Burton-on-Trent, refounded round about 1002. Refounded along the lines following the rule of St Benedict. And we know it's a refoundation from a very significant document in the Staffordshire Record Office. It's the will of Wolfric Spot, an Anglo-Saxon noble who endows the abbey at Burton and endows it with extensive estates. Burton becomes the most important abbey in Staffordshire. And we know it's a refoundation because the document states that Burton will be founded on which the monastery stands. There was something already here. Traditionally, an abbey was founded by uh, St Modwin in the 7th century, destroyed in Viking raids. And by the time we get to 1066, something like 50 monasteries in England and Wales and around about a thousand monks. Nunneries never regain their same status that they had in the early Anglo-Saxon period. Compared with the monasteries, they're always smaller, always poorer, providing lower standards of education, etc. Now, 1066, get into the Norman Conquest, and we're going to feel the impact then of a monastery that was founded at Cluny in Burgundy in 909 was founded by William of Aquitaine. What was different about Cluny? It was under direct papal authority. It was entirely independent of bishops and archbishops. Why was it set up that way? There was a perception at the time, particularly on the continent, that lax discipline was widespread. Monastic ideals had been corrupted in many places. And this was a, a move to get back to basics and back to stricter discipline, ascetic ideals, if you like. And Cluny's influence spread. It became a mother house. It had linked foundations. They were all subordinate to the abbot at Cluny. These subordinate foundations were priories under a prior. And this is the origin of priories. They come into existence first as subsidiaries of Cluny. And the order will spread to England after the Norman Conquest, reporting from England to Cluny. This is why they become known as alien houses. And the surge of monastic activity we've seen will continue after the Norman Conquest and even increase in pace. And that is where we will go next. If you've enjoyed this video, hit the like and subscribe buttons and click on the notification bell to be informed when the next video is released. 
or you can subscribe by clicking on the rose window over my shoulder.